one of the um, projects that we've seeded um, is a project that is based on this premise that maybe in American life what we need isn't fewer arguments, maybe what we just need are less stupid arguments. Right? And I don't mean that just in the kind of casual, dismissive way of how stupid cable TV is or how stupid you know, uh, social media flame wars are. Those are stupid. Um, but I mean, when we think about better arguments and what does it mean to have better arguments, it means recognizing that, you know, to go back to the refrain question throughout these last uh, 30 hours, what is, it, what is America? What does it mean to be American? America is, if nothing else, an argument. America is this perpetual motion argument machine, right? America is this set of core, unresolvable, irreconcilable tensions. And there's, a, there's a, actually a finite set of these tensions between liberty and equality, right? And you got a little taste of that between Matt and Heather, right? Matt has a preference for liberty and Heather a preference for equality. And those are in tension with each other. They're, they're just cliche American words but when you actually think about it, for you really to have equality, you're going to have to infringe on somebody's liberty. And for you really to have liberty, you're going to have to say bye-bye equality. Right? Those things are in tension. There's another tension between, for those of you who are well fans of the musical Hamilton, between a Hamilton view and a Jefferson view of the role of government. Should we have strong central government that makes us a nation? Should we have weak central government that allows us to flourish from the bottom up and the ground up, right? There's an inherent tension between the pluribus side of our slogan and the unum side, right? There's an inherent tension between color blindness and color consciousness. To have better arguments in American life is to really sit with those tensions, number one, but number two, to figure out how we ourselves can become more literate in those tensions so that we can pass on to others the modes of better argument. And I'm not sure I can think of a better foursome here for, uh, to discuss what these kinds of tensions are and how it's possible, no matter where you stand or sit, uh, to begin to find ways into better, more fruitful arguments. So let me quickly introduce our panel, and then I want to dive in with a common question for all of them. Um, uh, only for purposes uh, of the stage seating, to my left is uh, Rebecca Burgess um, from uh, the American Enterprise Institute. Um, and Rebecca um, is uh, one of the leaders uh, at AEI of their civic education and civic engagement uh, program. Uh, AEI, some of you may know, um, headed by um, one of Rebecca's colleagues named Arthur Brooks, um, is one of the most interesting places on the right right now. Uh, because the ways that they're coming at their traditional philosophies of um, limited government and greater competition and choice um, is from uh, a place that actually we were talking about earlier today of dignity. What does it mean to actually recognize human dignity and what does it mean to build civic systems and civic learning around notions of, uh, of, of, of human dignity? And what does it mean then to actually um, put that universal into the particular language of the American creed? And Rebecca and her team have been really doing interesting work on that. Rebecca also coined a phrase uh, um, in talking about this moment that we're in and saying that uh, uh, the Trump era and the rise of Trumpism um, is something of a Sputnik moment for civic education right now and civic engagement, right? It is. It's a Sputnik moment. That, that thing is up in the sky beeping at us and people are freaking out, right? Uh, and that means that people are suddenly learning and engaging and brushing off their dusted copies of the Constitution. Uh, and there's a... Nobody put ba puts baby in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Rinku Sen, um, who many of you will remember from previous conferences and who um, is the uh, president of Race Forward and uh, uh, the publisher of Color Lines. Um, and one of the country's most thoughtful and thought-provoking... Um, I'm not sure what the right noun is. It's not quite editor. It's not quite educator. Kind of curators of ways of thinking about race and identity in ways that challenge lots of left-right preconceptions. Um, next, then, we have uh, Jeremy Hale, who is one of the um, four co-authors of the original document, Indivisible, um, which, um, yes, I hear someone applauding, and Indivisible, um, a guide uh, written by a group of uh, uh, current and former congressional staffers uh, for citizens, uh, teaching citizens how to find those jujitsu pressure points that make a member of Congress 
uh, buckle at your knees. Um, <laughs> Uh, and how to organize people to pressure congressional offices and members of Congress. And Indivisible is a guide that went super viral, A, on the internet, but now B, um, has seeded, is it thousands? 6,000. 6,000 uh, Indivisible chapters um, in, a, in a way that Hayek and Matt Kibbe would be proud of because it's spontaneous order. Spontaneous order has happened here where the seed of this document has created all kinds of bottom-up uh, 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 organizing in resistance to the Trump administration ag and agenda. Uh, and then last, uh, and certainly not least, uh, my, uh, for many years, friend, uh, uh, Ruben Navarrete, who is uh, uh, a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post uh, uh, Writers Group, um, and uh, in his own way, an educator. Um, uh, we will talk about that. Author as well uh, of a book that brought us together first nearly 20 years ago, A Darker Shade of Crimson, um, talking about growing up uh, Mexican American and Mexican American, and um, going to um, a school with the unfortunate uh, color uh, crimson as its color, Harvard, um, and uh, 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 and the ways in which he had to navigate that transition of worlds and lives. Uh, and in his columns today, he really um, I'll let uh, Ruben describe his own politics. I suppose some people lump him into the right, but the way that he writes is basically resistant to categorization and the way that he engages with his readers is as well. So um, welcome to all of you. And <clears throat> I want to pose this initial common question to you, just um, a really simple one. What is most frustrating to you right now about the way we have political arguments in this country? And we, we can start, Ruben. I don't know if you want to, you want to start. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be with you and, and great to be with all of you. I have, um, you know, I believe in the, uh, Robert Kennedy philosophy of the harshest criticism goes hand in hand with the greatest love and respect. And so I really have enjoyed my time here at this convening. So I'm gonna offer one little bit of criticism. And that is that for, and I believe as Eric believes that we need better arguments, more arguments. I'm kind of struck by the fact that in the programs I've seen up to now, there have not been arguments right. on stage, right? <laughs> and I got a dose of a whole different experience yesterday, thanks to Eric when he had us at a private convening, and needless to say, there were arguments there. <laughs> so it's been a different, it's been a bit of a dichotomy here. In terms of what's here on this stage, um, we need to have more discussion debates and know that we're all gonna be friends afterward, but we're gonna disagree, and so that's why I'm here. Um, I, I stir the pot. I'm gonna pick a fight with all of you. Um, what frustrates me most about arguments I keep coming, coming back to this, and I've thought this, about this since um, Eric told us about the topic, the ascribing of motives, the dismissing of the other person's point of view because I don't want to do the work of having to go through it. So if I am challenged by someone on the far right or the far left, and I know instantly that we disagree on whatever issue, I have sort of two choices. One is to walk through that disagreement with you on abortion, gun control, immigration, whatever. And the other is to dismiss you and say, well, you're just a, you're just saying that because. And that's the ascribing of motives that we do almost instantly now. And it's almost become a joke that when Hillary Clinton was competing with Bernie Sanders, if you said something critical of Bernie Sanders, then automatically you must be with Hillary. And if you said something critical of Hillary, well, you must be with Sanders. And if you, attack Donald Trump, well, you must be with Hillary, and vice versa. It was always sort of a, an attempt to short circuit the debate because we don't wanna do the work of having to go through it. So we always try to do this. We try to put people in boxes and then smash the box. And everybody does it. The, you, there are actually two interesting things you said there that we'll come back to because um, it, it, ascribing motives is still separate from not wanting to do the work of uh, really understanding their argument. So we'll, we'll come back to that. But uh, Rinku, what frustrates you most? Yeah, you know, um, I should definitely go next because, <laughs> because what frustrates me, I, I do racial justice work. I've been doing it for decades. And what frustrates me so much about the way we argue about race, which has enormous effects on elections, on public policy, and on just civic life, is the way in which we conflate intention and impact on questions of racial bias and uh, racial discrimination. And 
that, that conflation really comes from having a too narrow and overly narrow definition of racism, of racial discrimination, um, and imagining that the only kind that exists is intentional, individual, and overt. So um, if, a, if something happens that um, has a racial tinge to it, then all of us, whichever side of that uh, incident that we are on, all of us actually operate from uh, racism as individual, intentional, and overt as our primary definition. And it leads to the typical debate about racial bias looking like this, um, uh, looking like a, a the search to identify the racist so that we can punish the racist. Our actual civil rights laws are built on that notion, and it goes like this. Something happens, uh, I say, um, you're a racist. The person accused says, no, I'm not, and usually produces some evidence, as in uh, the wife of color, uh, to prove that I'm not. And, uh, and then other people get involved, and they say, he's a racist, no, he's not. And eventually we kind of get tired of that cycle, the accusation defense cycle, and that's the end. That is the end. There's no examination of systems or unconscious bias or um, even the strategic hiding of racial bias. That can happen too. And that ends up meaning that we don't actually come up with collective solutions. So um, it's, it's really difficult for Am Americans to imagine that racial harm can come without evil intention. If there is racial harm, there must be evil intention. And instead of dealing with the harm, what we try to deal with is the intention. And it's impossible. It, it, you can't get yourself out of that um, cycle. So one of the things we try to do, do you want me to save what we do Yeah, for sa later? save that. I okay, wanna, so uh, intention and impact being conflated in a definition of racism in particular. Well, I think, and Rebecca, I mean, part of what's interesting about what Rinku just said here on the, you know, systemic side of things, which often gets overlooked when you get into the person X is or isn't, um, good or evil, um, so much of the civic education that you are uh, trying to revive interest in is about understanding systems, right? But um, for you, um, what is it that's most frustrating about the kinds of, you know, arguments uh, that uh, either you find yourself in, or maybe as Ruben's saying about today or otherwise, that you find people trying to you know, go around. So I'm gonna have a really um, 30, th 30 foot thousand view, I guess I would say of that <laughs> perhaps. Um, and I wanted to start by saying that, there, one, thank you uh, for convening this conversation and inviting me to it. And that's, uh, it's really a privilege to be here and thank all of you for giving of your time to listen to this. And of course, a big shout out to Citizen University for, I think I can only describe it as great hospitality. So thank you. <laughs> um, so I've had these, these verses of a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay just kind of wandering in my head like, you know, the walking dead almost. And um, they go something like this. Read history. So know your place in time and go to sleep. All this was done before. And of course, you know, it's two o'clock, so I'm not asking you to go to sleep. But, um, but I think the point is to, to take a breath and to step back. And when I do that, what most frustrates me about our arguments, our political arguments, is actually how we use the word politics. And how we use that word is really confusing. We say politics is this nasty, dirty, horrible thing that happens in Washington with evil people who are corrupt, gross, disgusting. Turn off my TV now. And then we say this other thing. Rebecca, what do you want to do when you grow up? You can be president. And I say, yes, that's so cool. Wait, maybe no. I don't know. Really bad press. Um, and then, but we think that our, our, our brightest and most ambitious people should want to go do that horrible thing? I don't know. Uh, and then we talk about politics this way. Politics is the way of governance or governing um, that needs to happen. It's the Federal Reserve. It's taxes. It's, uh, you know, the Navy keeping track of the underwater cable so that we can all have our internet and our devices and all these other things. And then it's this other thing. And that is the way of life that we as Americans do, the American polity. That's really confusing to have one word that means so many various things that sound like two opposites, a good thing and a bad thing, or a bad thing that we want good people to do. And that gets me to, to the actual frustration, which is there is a poverty of vocabulary that we have that's actually premised on a poverty of knowledge, the civic knowledge that you're talking about. We no longer have the common terms because we no longer have the common knowledge about what this thing is that we do 
we don't know what our form of government is. Um, and if we don't know that what the powers are, that there's executive, judicial, and you know, it sounds boring, but it's pretty fascinating, then we don't know who has those powers. And then we don't know, crucially, how those powers ought to be utilized. And if we don't know that, then how can we meet it to even have that argument? Because we can't even talk. What are we talking about? Um, and just two thirds of Americans can't name all three branches of government. 35% of educated adult Americans don't even know one of the names of the branches of government. To me, I mean, <laughs> uh, I wish we could have arguments, but we can't get to those arguments unless we have that knowledge. And this is, uh, I mean, it's a cousin to the thing that's being said a lot today about uh, that Matthew Dowd was saying last night about facts and opinions, and you can have your own opinions, but you know, if everybody has their own facts, we, we aren't able to even proceed. But you're not even talking about facts just like this is a stage. You know, you're talking about more complex facts about this is how stuff gets done. Right? And, um, and so if a president, whether it's the previous president or the current president, uh, promises that if Congress doesn't do it, I will, and each of them has said, yeah. each of them said such a thing. If Congress won't do it, I will, right? Um, then millions and millions of people think, either liking it or disliking it, gosh, if Congress doesn't do it, he will, right? And what they don't realize is it doesn't quite work that way, right? And so your point about civic knowledge being absent um, and, and depriving us in the first place of being able to have these arguments goes straight, Jeremy, to what you all been doing, right? I mean, Indivisible um, is trying to play this catch up in this Sputnik, Sputnik moment to educate some of those uh, adults already and, and, and maybe people still in school uh, about how stuff actually happens. What, what um, I don't know if your answer to the question of what frustrates you most about our arguments has changed since Indivisible became a thing. Um, if it has, say so, but either way, tell us what it is that frustrates you. Well, my, uh, my thought when you asked the question was uh, kind of related to Rubens, uh, which was that uh, the sort of tendency we have to uh, stereotype people who disagree with us. And uh, in logic, I think you would call this, you know, creating straw men. Uh, so on the left, you know, we're a bunch of communists uh, who, uh, just want to open the borders and tax the rich and, um, and spread the wealth around. And on the right, they're just cold-hearted capitalists who don't believe in government and um, want to deport or incarcerate anybody who isn't white. Um, but I think the truth is more complicated. And there I would just go to a, you know my personal experience. I, I grew up in Texas, and I know a lot of uh, very conservative people there. And I know that they care very deeply about the poor. Um, I know that they uh, give very generously at their churches and that they uh, take in refugees and that they visit prisons. And um, you know, it's just that they are not, they're suspicious about the role of government. And on our side, you know, we do believe in personal responsibility, but we believe the government has a role uh, to ensure that people are fed and housed and um, uh, protected uh, in the justice system um, and um, get health care and a good education. Um, so I think I would start by saying that um, if we can stop turning our political opponents into sort of cartoonish villains, uh, then I think that we can have um, more honest and uh, productive debates. Now, the cartoonish villains part may go to indivisible that we can talk about as well. Um, okay, I, actually, that, that's, a, that's a good thought to come back to, um, but, but I want to return, R Ruben, to the, this ascribing of motives notion, um, uh, which Rinku picked up on as well. You know, I, I think the, the um, some of you have heard me talk about and uh, uh, sell the book of this esteemed man named C. Terry Warner, um, who wrote a book called Bonds That Make Us Free, um, and it's a book uh, by this organizational psychologist who Descri describes this universal deep dynamic in human life. All of us, whatever scale, whether it's our relationships or our community life or uh, public uh, political debates. Um, and it's a cycle of self-justification, which he shorthands this way. I accuse you in order to excuse me. Right? Happens 10 times a day. <laughs> right? Um, I, I accuse you in order to excuse me. Um, and 
you know, that is so bound up with the way that we ascribe motives, right? One of the best ways for me to, if I know somewhere deep inside my conscience that I'm either in the wrong or I have some piece of responsibility for whatever the situation is, and I don't want to carry it, then I can put it on you. One of the best ways to put it on you is to just ascribe motives to you that force you to be on the defensive, right? And so, I mean, Ruben, you, 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 you want more argument here, but I actually quite agree with you on this notion, and your the way you, I encourage you to follow Ruben on Facebook because it's not just that his, he writes these columns on race and immigration and the rest that um, stir the pot, but that he's always engaging with his readers. He's always publishing reader mail um, and not just publishing the ones that say, you know, you're awesome. Uh, um, not too and, many of those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so h how, how have you trained yourself to break that cycle of accuse to excuse and ascribe motives in order to let yourself off the hook? That's a good question. First, let me give you a really vivid example of ascribing motives and someone trying to shove me into a box so that they can dismiss me. And I'm going to pick somebody who, along with my mom, I can say, you know, loves me more than anybody, and that's my wife. And so even my wife doesn't play fair, right? <laughs> um, I'm, after 15 years of marriage, I'm sure God gave me a wife so that I would never be at a loss to point out where I'm wrong. And she does do that well. And we had both come to the Trump victory, there's a name you haven't heard in this convening. We, uh, we both came to the Trump victory from the same place. We were both never Trump. We, I wrote extensively about why Trump was dangerous and dishonest and all these things. And on election day, neither one of us voted for Trump. But on election day, okay, it is in my core and my fiber that electoral college or no electoral college, he's the president. And at that moment, I decided to give him a chance. And so I was part of that camp of people who never wanted Trump, but was willing to give him a chance. My wife was not. For, for her, she was ready to impeach him on like November 9th, the day after the election, right? <laughs> and so when we started watching the news a couple months later, and there was the, the scene about the immigration ban and the turmoil and chaos at airports, this resonated with my wife in a way it does not, did not resonate with me. Because I come from this mixed marriage. And by that I mean I am Mexican-American and my wife is Mexican. My wife was born in Guadalajara, and she came here, I have to say a disclaimer, legally, <laughs> as a child many years ago, and I was born in the United States to parents who were born in the United States, and three of my four grandparents were born in the United States. So I, well, I worship at the altar of Thomas Jefferson, and this became a problem for us because as this was happening at the airports, she kept hitting me in a soft spot, you know, saying, you don't get it because you're an American. You do not understand what it's like to be pulled over in an airport and have your passport and your citizenship questioned because you're an American, which means I don't even know where my birth certificate is. All of you are with me. You don't know where your social security card is, your original social security card, and your birth certificate because part of being an American, we, we worked that out just right. You know, It's all our doing that we were born here. We won this lottery of the womb. We had nothing to do with it. We get to take very lightly this notion of citizenship, and my wife doesn't. So she decided to characterize me this way and say, hey, you know, it's, to some degree it's really not your fault that you don't get it because you're an American. And because you are US born and not foreign born, uh, you don't understand why looking at the TV, the house is on fire. Literally, the White House is on fire. <laughs> what are you not getting? And I'm saying they're like, well, let's just give them some time. And so, it, it happens, and what I try to do to counter that in both personal relationships and in my, my work is to think about what others are doing that seem to me to be the problem and do the opposite. And that is in our public discourse, which is broken, and our American conversation, which is broken, there's a great amount of dishonesty, so I try to be honest. There's a great lack of common sense, so I try to hold on to common sense with both hands against a windstorm. Uh, and that's sometimes challenging. There's a lot of partisanship, so I try to be nonpartisan. And there's also a lot of uh, a lack of, there's a, a great lack of introspection. It's what Eric said. Part of I accuse you to excuse me is to say, you've got all these things wrong with you, but I don't. So let me have, I have the luxury and time to work on your problems, <laughs> since I'm perfect. And we, as a community of Americans, and the 52 to 54 million Latinos in this country, we spend so much time finger pointing 
that we don't do enough introspection. We don't look at what we're doing wrong. We always think about what you're doing wrong. Rebecca, I actually want, want, want to come to you here because coupled with civic knowledge is what you might call civic dispositions, right? P part of what Ruben was just describing and unpacking. Um, we, you've already given some statistics about how poorly, how, how much we failed systemically to teach civic knowledge. How can we be doing better to teach some of these dispositions, e either in or out of school? And what are you all doing at AEI to, uh, on that front? So I, I think that they are linked. I think that you can't have the, cr the I don't want to use the word correct because that, that's, not, that's not it. You cannot have the, the American, um, the traditional, if you will, American dispositions, uh, de democratic dispositions if you don't have the knowledge. And so I think that they're, they're the two hands of the same body. Um, and that the, the goal of the, dis of the outcomes, the civic outcomes that we all talk about, we look at voting and, and even though I would argue that voting shouldn't be our measurement of, of a functional democracy, it's, it's an, a very important one. Um, if we can't get to that, the goal of, of sh people showing up at um, a, a polling place and voting comes from the disposition, and that disposition comes from an investment in in this project. So, I want to vote because I know that there is this immense experiment called American democracy that allows me to actually say on a piece of paper this way, not this way, um, yes, no, and that most people in the rest of the world still don't get to do that. But, and I think that's, you know, there, there are problems, et cetera, but, but that disposition came from certain facts and having to contend with certain facts that there was this revolution, why was there this revolution, et cetera. And then, and then also the, the other part of, of um, you know, family and working in, in civic engagement community. My, my grandmother was a, a huge proponent of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and some of that is just in my family. Um, beyond the always be prepared <laughs> um, uh, for the snowstorm and you know all that stuff. Um, and I, I think that that's actually one of the, the difficulties of, of our lack of civic education today is that it gets hung up often on should we focus on just the civic dispositions um, and teaching that and on the right, a lot of people think that's what happens in the home. Um, the government shouldn't really be involved in that because the, the family is the place for that or you get it by going to church or something like that. So don't waste you know, time. And actually on the left that happens too. It's, it's um, we need to be civically engaged and we'll push that. Um, but talking about values, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, too, you know, too, too dangerous or, or those are things that other people do and, and, and all of that. So what happens is that it gets dropped by both sides um, effectively, I would say. So Rinku, this, the, the, the values piece of, you know, if, uh, there's so many aspects of trying to have better arguments around race and American identity, for instance, that um, you were alluding to, but um, is the yeah. values piece central here? It is. I, I was actually a little bit surprised to hear you say that about the left, because all of our work starts with values, and that's often where we find the most um, ability to move forward. So um, we, have different, we have different definitions of racism. That's a problem. But we all agree that racism is bad. That's a good thing. And um, that as a society, we don't want to embrace and advance racism. I think part of the obstacle that's created from that narrow definition where we assign intention is that when people like me talk about systemic racism or systemic bias, what many white people is here, here is you're calling me racist. Like they literally hear the words, you are racist, coming out of my mouth when I say, oh, there's bias built into the system, perhaps. Um, and what we hear when, what people of color hear when white people deny systemic racism is, I'm gonna open the door and let the Klan in because who cares, you know? And neither one of those things is actually happening. When I say systemic racism, I'm not saying you are racist. Um, and when you can't see systemic racism, you're not necessarily like trying to let the Klan out of the closet so they can come attack me. But those are the reactions that we have to each other. What we have tried to do is make impact our measure, not intention. And that does not mean for white folks that you get to use good intention as um, absolution, but neither does it mean for people of color that when white people say, well, I didn't intend to have to be racist when I use the word illegal or when I um, required passed a voter, voter uh, ID law, I didn't intend to be racist. It means that people of color can't say, 
you know, fuck your good intentions, forgive me, but that is often what we actually say. Um, so, so, and, you know, I think really uh, what we have found to be productive is to assume good intention and, um, and then measure accountability based on the impact of our actions and our collective decisions. Because really, I, I, we cannot judge what's in people's hearts. I, and I'm not talking about the explicitly white nationalist crowd here. I mean, obviously, they call themselves racist, and, and that's fine, you know, they're good with that. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of the American polity, and, um, and everybody else has good intention. Um, what we're not sophisticated at is examining whether what kind of impact we're having and then making new decisions so we can have better collective impact um, that actually closes the racial divide. That takes a lot of discipline to focus on impact rather than intention. It takes enormous emotional discipline. Mm. And, um, and that's a skill then that we have to develop is that discipline. So this is really interesting because Jeremy, I mean, part of what's feeding Indivisible's growth is something other than emotional discipline, I would say, right? It is actually emotional indulgence. And I don't mean this negatively, but people are mad, they're scared, they're angry, and they want to indulge that, and they're feeding into this great infrastructure that's emerged called indivisible, right? right. So when people show up and they're fired up and they want to fight, resist, defeat, crush, um, uh, do you feel like, okay, this is just not gonna be the time to do what either Ruben or Rinku are talking about, or do you find that you know once you get folks gathered, uh, you've got to also teach them different ways to not do to uh, people who might support Donald Trump or might be Republican or might be Democrats, but you know, not engage on this stuff uh, to to demonize or dehumanize or um, you know oversimplify them that way. Right, and I think that we're on two levels here. So in our personal uh, debate and civic engagement, uh, we need to not be questioning people's motives. But I think with the Trump administration, what is motivating a lot of the, the activism is, is the idea that this president really does have uh, terrible motives and uh, you know, is deeply unpopular, um, is trying to use a mandate that he doesn't have uh, to remake the country in his own uh, racist and xenophobic and corrupt image. And so uh, after the election, a group of former congressional staffers came up with this indivisible guide. And the idea is that Donald Trump's agenda doesn't depend on Donald Trump. It depends on individual members of Congress uh, choosing to go along with that agenda or choosing to resist it. And so the idea is that that gives constituents a lot of power. And I think if there's any silver lining to Trump's election, it's sort of the outpouring of activism and engagement that we've seen since then. And you mentioned that, you know, there are, <laughs> uh, there are 6,000 indivisible groups, at least two in every single congressional district in the country. We're talking Eastern Tennessee and rural Alabama and Arkansas and Utah. And, you know. Are these just the, the, the little piles, little small, yeah clumps of blue in these very deep places, or are red folks coming to Indivisible now as well? There are red folks coming to Indivisible now as well. If you look at some of these town hall videos that are coming out, and you hear uh, these individuals with sort of deep southern accents asking Senator Tom Cotton why he's taking away their health care, uh, these are not, you know, East Coast elites like some of these members of Congress would want you to believe, and it's having an impact. Uh, the biggest one being that for the last seven years, Republicans said that as soon as they regained power, uh, they were going to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act. And we saw yesterday that didn't happen, and that's because individual, individuals in Arkansas, in Illinois, and Kentucky, and New Jersey went to their members of Congress and said that uh, you represent us, you don't represent Donald Trump. And members of Congress are very responsive to their constituents, and they'll think twice about siding with an administration against their constituents. And I think that's a, we think that's a huge win for democracy. Ruben, you're, you're, you're shaking your head. T yeah. t t everybody, everybody sort of uh, sees their own reality and whatever's on the news. And I think Democrats are in an interesting, very interesting position right now because they want to be able to say, on the one hand, look, we had nothing to do with this. This was a Republican implosion. 
These were three different Republican factions all going to war. All we did was sit and have popcorn and enjoy the show. <laughs> so if you are unhappy and you see what happened in the last week as an example of broken government, that's not on us, that's all on them. And that's, that's fine. Because every talking head I saw on television and every member of Congress I saw was a Republican. This seemed to me, from my vantage point, to be a really big civil war among these three factions and a disagreement between Tom Cotton, Rand Paul, Paul Ryan, and with Trump basically saying, I'll go with Ryan, but if you convince me otherwise, I'm, I'm for grabs, right? And the Democrats just sort of sitting there saying, our option is to keep Obamacare, which all the Republicans agreed was not uh, something they wanted. So that's the first instinct for Democrats. The other instinct, on the other hand, is to come forward with fundraising letters like the one I'm already getting in my email. They're all getting in your email. It says, congratulations, we did it. We, the progressive left, killed <laughs> this. We saved Obamacare. Now send a check. Hit this button and donate. And I'm thinking, you guys have to pick a lane. I mean, if you're a Democrat and a progressive and a lefty and a liberal, did you or did you not have a hand in killing this effort to, as you say, kill Obamacare? And if you want to paint it one way, stick that way. But don't, don't change given the fact that you need to raise money on the one hand, and yet you need to feel somehow superior and apart from the civil war that engulfed the Republicans on the other hand. Those are two conflicting things, and if you're just paying attention, you'll see that you know, a lot of what we digest through the news, through the media, and through politics is a bullshit. So, so there you go, trying to be consistent. And um, you know, w w one of the things that I think is, is interesting, because I, I got those same fundraising um, e emails uh, today, right. Um, and and uh, you actually articulated uh, what I, a bit of my reaction that this was, uh, uh, at a minimum, disingenuous. Um, uh, but I think to be fair, uh, and, and part of what Jeremy's saying here is that, uh, you know, yes, this was a civil war that broke out among uh, uh, people in the Republican Party, uh, but the sense that they all had that they could not act without consequences, um, and that um, if they were indeed to go enact any version, frankly, of what was being proposed out there um, could lead them to great electoral uh, consequences is the result of what Indivisible and others have been doing, right? And I think that, that, that is the context within which that civil war uh, was unfolding, right? It wasn't a context in which um, they were totally dominating the field. It's context, uh, you're all the more nervous if you're in a civil war to think, Yay, if I win the Civil War, I'm going to get run over by a bulldozer, right? I, I, dis <laughs> I disagree. I, I disagree for this reason. I, I didn't hear any of them saying that they wanted to keep Obamacare as Republicans. And I think if you were Tom Cotton and you came forward with a Tom Cotton version of the kill Obamacare bill, Tom Cotton would sell that and try to sell that. And if he couldn't sell that back home, he wouldn't care. The problem with our government is that you have in Congress, in the Senate and in the House, a bunch of elitist Americans who have a really cool job that they want to keep, and they're so far removed and detached from regular Americans. And that is a bipartisan affliction. And I see it up close in the immigration debate, where you have 25 members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Do not make the mistake of thinking that those people are acting in the best interest of Hispanics. They're in fact all Democrats, and they're Democrats first and Hispanics second. When you go to Congress, whether you be a Democrat or Republican, you drink the tea, and as soon as you drink the tea, you become part of the problem. So I don't buy this notion that somehow Tom Cotton is afraid of his constituents. First of all, Tom Cotton only has to face his constituents every six years. Secondly, when he does, he'll have decimated the Republican side field, so he doesn't have any Republican challenger, and then he'll face a Democrat with a huge fundraising advantage and an incumbency re-election rate of 98%. The problem with our Congress is not that they fear us. I wish they feared us. The problem with our Congress, be it African-American, Latino, Democrat, Republican, or whatever, is they are on their own planet. <laughs> and they don't know us, and they don't care about us, and they don't fear us. <clears throat> uh, Jeremy, you wanna? A one sentence response on Tom Cotton. He came out against the repeal of Obamacare less than a week after he was confronted by 3,000 of his constituents in a televised town hall asking, why are you taking away my health care? And in your paper this morning, a freshman congressman from Illinois said that on election night, everybody in Congress thought that the repeal of Obamacare would sail through. 
And the reason it didn't is because, at least in his office, there were 1,959 calls against repeal and 30 for repeal. And that's a direct result of the activism that we're seeing on the ground. I think, if I could just say the other frustration I was gonna say about um, Americans and arguments is that we find it impossible to hold two causes of a problem at the same time. <laughs> and most of the time, most of our problems have more than one cause. Um, racism is not the cause of every problem we have, or not the only cause. Sometimes it's also sexism. Sometimes it's capitalism. Sometimes it's a, a lack of democracy. And I, I think both, both things can be true. Ruben, right. what you're saying is absolutely right. true. Lots of divorce uh, among our politicians our govern our uh, lawmakers from everyday people and it is also true that when Americans rise up and make a demand and do it in force it doesn't matter what you thought about them before that happened you're gonna react like a human being to that event happening um, so so that's a good point no. multiple causes and that probably means then that there are also multiple solutions one of the reasons we're not getting to like the best form of health it care that we could have and the best system is that um, we're not looking at the actual entire system and dealing with all the different kinds of causes of different kinds of uh, problems from personal um, you know bad eating to insurance companies, you know, screwing us every chance they get. So, yes, that's my little rant. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I piggyback? Yes, please, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, so, so slightly mirroring your frustration, my biggest frustration of all is that we think that democracy is easy. Um, and that this thing called self-government is like easy peasy, you just are born and it happens and we don't have to nourish it, we don't have to think about it, we don't have to sweat it. Um, and that is the biggest fallacy I think that, well, I mean that was part of my, my Sputnik moment thing is that this is really hard and there should be some type of, there is a competition in our arguments, um, that's kind of our tagline at AI, competition of ideas, um, but, but that we need that, we need to understand, you mentioned yesterday, learning, we don't, we don't respect learning, the process of learning any longer, because it's hard. That's what we need, that is democracy, it's the learning thing, so. Well, I, um, the, the, your last comment here calls to mind something that John F. Kennedy said when he was proposing that we send a man, uh, put, send a man to the moon within the end of the decade in which he was speaking, uh, and the line roughly, I don't remember exactly, he says that we should do this, um, not because it is easy, but because it is hard, right? And I think that is an ethic that has essentially evaporated from American life, right? Um, it, you, one could argue that it had already evaporated by the time John F. Kennedy, Kennedy was president. Um, uh, that, that was, you know, but, but the idea now that we should lean into things precisely because they're going to challenge us and push us um, uh, is, is really hard. And so the final question I want each of you to speak to here um, is... Look, you've talked about some very interesting tools, actually, um, for fostering better arguments, to be thinking systemically and not only in the natural human way individually, um, to be checking your instinct to ascribe motive, right? Um, to be uh, not, uh, and similarly, to check, to check your impulse uh, to ascribe identity to people just because they may be from one part of the country or another or speak with a certain accent and what their views and, and, uh, and the malleability of their views might be. Um, you've talked about these tools, including just simply marrying civic knowledge and civic dispositions. But at the end of the day, even though we are a mighty 600, um, we are a minority, if I may put it bluntly, right? And I don't mean that to be like, oh, woe is us, we, we, you know, uh, because the fact of power in civic life is that um, though we operate nominally on paper in a majority rule system, uh, in fact, we operate really in a minority rule system, which is to say nothing ever happens in this country except by the will of a minority, a really organized, focused minority saying, we're going to change the frame of the possible, right? Indivisible is beginning to be proof of that. The Tea Party was proof of that, right? A motivated minority. And so the question for those of us who are all motivated to try to foster better arguments, to try to get people to be a little less stupid, I don't mean that, again, casually, to be less kind of reflexively 
um, uh, unthinking uh, about civic engagement, um, what's the best way that we, this minority, um, can spread as a contagion the way that we want to make these arguments go? And I just each of you, if you could say, say a word really quickly. Ruben? I think uh, you've got to get out of your bubble. Everybody's got to gather bubble, me included, the opposition, Tea Party, Republicans, whatever. Everybody sort of sees their reality, as I said, from their own vantage point. And the degree to which you can, um, I remember being in New York in the office of my friend John Avalon, the editor of the Daily Beast, who's my boss, and him saying sort of an astonishment, now tell me again, why do you listen, and I do every single day for three hours, why do you listen to Rush Limbaugh? And I said, well, you know, 600 stations, 20 million listeners, been around a long time. I've done radio since I was in my 20s and uh, hosted radio shows and the like, and he really understands the medium. And so I'm saying, but I don't agree with everything. I, as I'm making my breakfast or making my kids breakfast, I can fashion the rebuttals in my head about things he's getting wrong, but why wouldn't I? You know, my day is so varied that I might listen to Limbaugh and Hugh Hewitt that's uh, another favorite radio host, and then I listen to NPR, and I read color lines, I would find the truth about the immigration debate and deportations from color lines, not from the New York Times, by the way. You know, and keep an open mind, and if you want, provide the rebuttals in your mind for what they're getting wrong, but at least you're gonna understand an issue in a fuller way. So that's my best advice, yep. to get out of our respective cocoons and read and intake things we don't always agree with. And real quick, just uh, thoughts from you. Yeah, I was just reminded uh, by, about the famous quote by Adlai Stevenson when he was told, you know, um, sir, all thinking people support you. And he said, yes, but I need to win a majority. <laughs> and uh, and I, think that, I think that in an era of alternative facts and 140 character tweets, I think that we need to fight for uh, the validity of, of evidence and reason, which after all are what arguments are. And we, we can't give that up. Yes, right now people are driven by emotion. We may need to galvanize that to stop bad things from happen, happening, but ultimately we need to reclaim facts and evidence and arguments. Hmm. Great, Rinku. So um, I, I'm gonna leave you with some advice from the Buddha. Um, I, I looked up this quote, because I thought it's a fake Buddha quote. He couldn't have ever said this. The quote was, so I'm gonna tell you the fake quote, and then I'm going to read you the two sentences of what the Buddha actually said. Um, so the whole idea is to detach ourselves from our own opinions, um, to uh, not be caught in the bond of opinion. And the, the fake quote is, um, people with opinions just go around bothering each other. And, but here's what the Buddha actually said. For one, not understanding as it really is the arising, the subsiding, the sweetness, the wretchedness, and the leaving behind of modes of opinion, who, with respect to opinion, is obsessed with passion for opinion, delight in opinion, affection for opinion, intoxication with opinion, thirst for opinion, fever for opinion, attachment to opinion, craving for opinion. This, monks, is called the bond of opinion. You can release yourself from it and have better arguments. Great, Rebecca. Uh, I'll go back to my Edna St. Vincent Millay read history. Um, James Madison also, who said, it's not just the facts, but it's the reflections on the facts um, that really help us. And so in that vein, I would, I would encourage everyone to support civic education in your school district, to support the civic education teachers. Um, they are a super small community, immensely in, in love with, with what they're doing, and they get very little love for it. Please join me in thanking Rebecca, Rinku, Jeremy, and Ruben. Thank you very much for a great conversation.